Welcome to this third section of this lymphedema lecture on assessment and treatment of lymphedema. It is in this section that I will provide you with an understanding of how lymphedema presents, uh, particularly as related to stage of lymphedema, and how conservative treatment is applied, uh, particularly by uh, those practitioners such as yourself. And we'll talk about the process for uh, lymphedema certification as well. So the definition of lymphedema I discussed a little bit in the last section is that it's an accumulation of excess interstitial fluid and reactive fibrosis due to an insufficiency of the lymphatic system. So <clears throat> it's that reactive fibrosis and its effect on the pro high protein concentration that causes that hardening of the tissues. And again, it exists because of the deficiency in the lymphatic system. So here, the lymph load or the amount of fluid in the interstitium needing to be removed is actually greater than the transport capacity. And, um, and this is typically due to a reduced transport capacity and not an increased lymph load. So um, just to kind of simplify that a little bit is that when you have, for example, fluid from congestive heart failure, you have an enormous lymphatic load, but a normal functioning lymphatic system, at least for a while. What happens with lymphedema is that you can have a normal fluid load, um, such as you and I would um, develop in the course of a day or any moment, um, but because our transport capacity is so diminished when we have lymphedema, it can't remove that even normal um, amount of lymph load. So stages of lymphedema, um, typically we define between stage zero and three. Stage zero is a clinically latent stage where there actually is some known impairment in the lymphatic system, but there's not yet any objective evidence of swelling. Instead, the patient will complain of just some heaviness and vague aching or discomfort in the limb, but your clinical signs and symptoms uh, such as pitying or obvious visual um, evidence of swelling are typically absent in this uh, stage. Stage one is reversible uh, lymphedema in which there is some accumulation of the protein-rich fluid. Oftentimes it's visible. Um, but it's still very soft and pitting because those um, uh, proteins have not started to fibrose yet. This stage reduces with elevation, um, but typically most often will go on to subsequent, a subsequent stage such as stage two, um, not always. In stage two, uh, which is spontaneously irreversible, uh, connective tissue begins to form, and at that point, elevation is ineffective. So somebody may go to bed at night with a swollen limb. When they wake up, it's pretty much still swollen. <clears throat> and uh, they begin to possess some um, more brawny, brawny edema, um, some more fibrotic changes to the tissues. And then finally, stage three is lymphostatic elephantiasis with severe and very extensive connective and scar tissue formation. The dermal tissues begin to harden. There's chronic inflammation, often infections, and the presence, there may be presence of papillomas um, or tumors. Um, papillomas are some um, uh, warty type projections on the skin, and we'll see examples of all of these shortly. So back to our stages, uh, just to um, show you kind of a clinical scenario of each stage. Uh, stage zero, the latency stage, you can see this individual here um, doesn't appear to have any swelling in her hands or forearms or upper arms, but nevertheless, um, this would be someone who perhaps had had some breast cancer surgery with some lymph nodes removed if that is a sufficient challenge to the lymphatic drainage system, she may say, hey doc, you know, I'm noticing some heaviness in my arm. 
We definitely know that she is at risk for developing lymphedema. And this is a very valuable time to provide education um, in management of um, pending lymphedema, um, maybe some self-massage, um, and certainly infection prevention. And all of these would be taught to you um, if you went through a lymphedema certification course. So we know now that stage zero may be reversible under optimal circumstances, but not when it is ignored. Stage one is reversible lymphedema. And this may actually even be a little bit more edema than you might see in stage one, um, but it's very soft and pitting. Often it does fluctuate and reduce with elevation. Um, as you can see here, there's definitely edema in the hand and the arm, uh, but not severe by any means. This person, rather than requiring education and doing a lot of maybe self-treatment, this is one where she may require some visits to the clinic for actual uh, performance of manual lymphatic drainage or instructions in how she can best uh, provide some compression treatment or some self-massage. Stage two lymphedema is spontaneously irreversible. Here's where more connective tissue um, um, proliferation has formed. This is where the limb becomes quite significantly enlarged compared to an unaffected other side. And uh, firm pitting is often possible. There may also be a little bit of inflammation to the leg because again, it's, a, it's, an, in, it's an inflammatory process of sorts. So there may be slight warmth and reddening to the leg without um, uh, actual presence of infection. Here's advanced stage two or stage three. And um, this actually highlights the point that there are not always clear cut borders between a stage one and a stage two or stage two and stage three. It's kind of a continuum. Now, this does not necessarily mean that a patient who begins to develop lymphedema and has stage one is inevitably going to arrive at stage three at some point. No, many, many, many patients will stay, often in a stage two of some sorts, and they um, provide uh, self-care and management to that lymphedema in stage two. Um, you have proliferation and fibrosclerosis and adipose tissue development. As you can see, the deep skin creases at the knuckles and at the wrist. Um, that is very uh, classic for a stage three lymphedema. This one is a very advanced stage three lymphedema. Again, we call elephantiasis. Again, because it reminds one of an elephant limb. Um, there is severe fibrosclerosis, which forms, and then also many secondary skin changes, some chronic inflammation, you can see down on the distal leg near the ankle, perhaps uh, some fungal infection. It's a little bit hard to tell. Um, papillomas um, are those evidence you can see on the distal uh, posterior aspect of her thigh. There's some bumpy areas. Uh, those are um, present as papillomas. Um, and so there are many adverse skin changes which occur with the um, increasing severity of lymphedema. And if somebody gets to the point where the limb is so large that they cannot move, this leads to then invalidism. <clears throat> so uh, you have to think that in addition to having severe influence on functional abilities, that lymphedema also would cause considerable quality of life concerns. And stop to think about what some of those might be. So first of all, appearance. Who would feel comfortable going out into public with a very enlarged limb or limbs? 
is this person able to wear regular street clothes and shoes? We know that with an increase in edema comes uh, an increased likelihood for infection. So this person may be on and off antibiotics or in and out of the hospital for infections. Um, although lymphedema itself is not typically categorized as painful, people with severe lymphedema will report over and over how heavy it feels and the skin is tight and the limb is just generally uncomfortable. And then uh, add to that all of the fun functional limitations that they would have. So here's some things that I just talked about. I just wanted to kind of brainstorm with you before I showed you a list. Um, many of those points we just brought up are on this list. One I didn't bring up was wound healing uh, because uh, when swelling is, um, has invaded the tissues so much, if a wound is present, um, there's a little chance for that wound to get good oxygen and nutrients in the presence of a large amount of edema. Types of lymphedema, we have already discussed this, so I'm not going to go into it at length. Um, primary, um, primary kind of gets broken down into congenital primary lymphedema, where lymphedema is present at birth, that you can actually see the limb is swollen. Uh, lymphedema precox, um, which occurs earlier in life, often showing swelling first around teenage years, or sometimes lymphedema tardum, where the individual will have no apparent um, uh, lymphedema for several decades, only to later develop it. Um, secondary lymphedema we have previously talked about. Management of lymphedema. So there's a variety of medical interventions which have been um, recommended in the past. Some work better than others. Elevation does in the early stages, in stage one and maybe stage zero, uh, is helpful with lymph drainage. Um, but how long do you elevate? And is it convenient? Um, if it's in your leg, you obviously have to lie down in order to elevate your leg. So that doesn't work so, off so well. Diuretics, unfortunately, are frequently prescribed uh, for lymphedema. Um, they should not be prescribed for the disease of lymphedema because they remove the water but not the protein. Therefore, the proteins pull the water back in. Now, don't get me wrong, don't be mistaken. Diuretics for many medical conditions are indicated. Many patients with cardiac problems, some vascular problems, and, and many other medical conditions may need diuretics. So don't go to the physician too hastily and say, this patient shouldn't be on diuretics. Uh, but if they're on exclusively because of lymphedema or an impairment in the lymphatic system, um, maybe uh, have that discussion with the physician. Pneumatic compression, uh, these are your pumps. Um, pneumatic compression pumps. Um, have been used with some amount of success for many decades. Uh, one of the problems is if they have a true lymphedema and the lymphatic system is broken down, using solely an extremity pump may push the fluid proximally and create proximal edema around a shoulder, for instance, on the arm, or up even into the genital region in the legs. Uh, compression garments, you've seen compression stockings, sleeves, gloves, that sort of thing. And um, certainly our patients with lymphedema commonly, uh, almost more the rule than the exception, receive compression garments to help control their swelling. However, it is essential that the limb is decongested first through appropriate treatment techniques prior to proper fitting with compression garments. Over and over and over, I have seen in my clinical practice where a patient will be seen in a doctor's office. The doctor recognizes the fact that the patient has a lot of edema um, or lymphedema. They'll often call it lymphedema and say, okay, go to, the, to a DME, durable medical equipment provider, and get yourself some compression stockings. And so the DME provider 
um, uh, orders the garments, gets the garments in. They may even measure the patient properly. But because there's so much swelling, the garment doesn't fit well and it's difficult to don. So um, please keep this in mind as one of the key takeaways from this course is when you see a patient with edema, don't think get them into a sleeve or a stocking or some sort of compression device first but decongest the limb first, and we will talk about how to do that. And then there's complete decongestive therapy, CDT. That is the form of conservative therapy that I'll be describing um, in another several slides. And finally, there's microsurgery, which up until maybe a decade ago, we heard a little about microsurgery, particularly here in the United States. Microsurgery was more common in Europe, um, but now it's becoming more commonplace. Um, it's certainly not for everybody. Uh, everybody will not be a candidate. And furthermore, even if they are a candidate, they may not be in the location where there is a suitable surgeon to perform that very specialized type of uh, lymphatic microsurgery. These are uh, some examples of compression pumps. The one on the top picture is a conventional pump, one style of conventional pump, um, which covers only the lower extremities. And, um, and there was an, uh, an old article now, it's very dated, 1998. Uh, they studied patients who used pumps on lower extremities for lower extremity swelling. Um, 43 developed percent, excuse me, developed genital edema compared to 2.6% who did not use a pump on the lower extremities. So that's a scary percentage. Um, in contrast, there are now newer pumps out shown down in the lower uh, picture that actually incorporate um, some massaging effect to the trunk system, uh, to the either the uh, upper quadrant or lower quadrants of the trunk um, to help facilitate lymphatic drainage through uh, the healthy portion of the lymphatic system to help the um, uh, impaired portion. Uh, this is a um, more effective um, type of pump. So lymphatic surgeries for the fluid portion. So um, when somebody has lymphedema, it's a combination of fluid and then also, um, as the disease progresses, we know that it is adipogenic or it tends to produce adipose tissue as well. So the enlargement in a patient who has lymphedema, um, the, the enlargement in a limb in a patient who has lymphedema is typically a combination of some fluid, some fat. And you can tell somewhat by how much pitting there is um, and then also imaging can give an impression as to how much fat is present. But um, to manage the fluid portion, um, there's a couple of um, uh, surgical techniques that are available. One is the vascularized lymph node transfer, where lymph nodes are actually transferred from a donor site to um, a graft site. And that um, helps for. Um, uh, new lymph vessel node connections, which can help restore some of that lymphatic insufficiency. And then there are also lymphaticovenous anastomoses, where a lymph vessel is attached directly to a vein, um, <clears throat> a subdermal vein, and then that in turn empties into the venous system. So these patients uh, certainly have to be very well screened prior to surgery to see about their qualifications for surgery. Um, and in any event, most physicians performing these procedures will mandate that the patient does also receive conservative, complete decongestive therapy and garments first and then following the procedure. So, um, Sometimes you may hear, oh, it's a fix. You don't need to ever wear garments again, but that's not always the case. <clears throat> Here are some of the microsurgeries, the vascularized lymph node transfer. They take literally a little clump 
of fat and lymph nodes embedded in it, and that then um, gets hooked up to new lymphatics. And then here's an example of the lymphaticovenous anastomosis. This individual um, had primary lymphedema, very severe involvement of her right leg, and um, she had uh, vascularized lymph node transfer uh, as one of her surgeries. <clears throat> and you can see the size of her limb on the left compared with the size on the right. So she's already shown some reduction. And this individual was very, is very diligent to perform compression wrapping, compression garment wear, even though she has received that surgery. Now let's talk a little bit about the fat portion. I mentioned that a portion of the enlargement of the limb is due to adipose tissue. And in that case, and you can see in this image here uh, where there is a normal arm imaged on the left with some muscle tissue, soft tissue and fat around it in contrast to the lymphedematous arm on the right and see the large amount of excess fatty tissue. So a suction assisted protein lipectomy is a procedure that's basically, I like to call it a fancy liposuction. Um, it's not cosmetic, um, uh, but it does do great things for reducing the volume of a limb. And along with reducing the volume of the limb would reduce heaviness. Now it doesn't fix the lymphatic insufficiency, so it does not eliminate the need for compression garment use. But would you rather have a very large arm and need to wear a sleeve or a smaller arm and need to wear a sleeve? <clears throat> Here uh, is an individual who had a suction assisted protein lipectomy of her left leg. And you can see the nice change in um, reduction in volume throughout uh, the leg and thigh. So what can we do as therapists? Um, the conservative treatment is complete decongestive therapy. It is the treatment of choice for lymphedema management from a conservative standpoint. It's safe, it's comfortable, um, it feels good, um, and it's very effective. We use um, physiology and, an and anatomy um, to design our treatment. And in the treatment phase, where the patient actually will come into the clinic where you are, uh, manual lymph drainage is performed. And this is a specialized form of light massage that you would be taught in your certification program. And what this does is it stimulates those lymph collectors to work harder and pump more effectively. And you also utilize the healthy portion of the lymphatic system to pull along or kind of serve as a vacuum function to help drain the impaired function, the impaired portion of the lymphatic system. Manual lymph drainage is followed by skin and nail care to maintain optimal skin health and hygiene, followed by compression bandaging. And um, you will actually be practicing that in your um, integumentary class. And then exercise is done to employ the the, the muscle pump underneath the bandage because by the muscles pumping that has a stimulatory effect on the lymphatic vessels. <clears throat> Once the patient has um, displayed an optimal edema volume reduction and has met your goals of treatment, then the treatment phase is discontinued for the maintenance phase to begin. And since lymphedema is a chronic condition, one which the patient will always have, there is always a home program or some self-maintenance necessary on the part of the patient. Ideally, they will continue to wear their compression garment during the daytime. They may need to compression bandage at night or use some sort of night compression garment. Um, typically, night and day compression garments are different because daytime ones have high elasticity, which is not necessarily um, tolerated well at night. The patient will continue to attend to skin and nail care, moisturizing the limb when it's dry and cleansing it when it's necessary. 
um, performing exercise and perhaps self manual of drainage massage. Here's a picture of compression wrapping. We use something that looks like ACE bandages, but is not nearly as stretchy as ACE bandages. They're called short stretch bandages, which are 100% cotton with no added um, elasticity. They do stretch slightly because of the weave of the fabric. And those are applied from distal to proximal um, in an ascending fashion with more layers distally than proximally. And so it results in a pressure gradient, positive pressure gradient, which is highest distally and lowest proximally. Then when combined with exercises, in other words, muscle pumping, the muscles pump not only on the venous structures, but the muscles also pump on the lymphatic structures. So it's very important that the patient move and do some range of motion type exercises to promote both vascular and lymphatic return. Indications for CDT are primary or secondary lymphedema, obviously, but the beautiful thing is that you can use CDT in so many of your physical therapy patients, whether it's of a neuro population, an ortho population, maybe a just medically sick population, as long as you respect the contraindications listed on the right side of the screen, um, you can use complete decongestive therapy um, in many places and really benefit your patients for the purposes of edema reduction and the improvement in uh, quality of life. Mm -hmm. Contraindications we've already spoken of uh, include acute inflammation or infection or DVT, um, certain cardiac or pulmonary conditions, and what we haven't yet talked about is arterial insufficiency. But hopefully you remember from all your training up until this point is that when compression is applied to a limb, you first need to ensure that that patient has sufficient arterial circulation uh, such that you will provide no harm. So the mechanism of effectiveness of the manual lymph drainage, uh, just in a, in a nutshell, um, is that the body is divided into watersheds, um, left from right, um, uh, uh, down the center of the spine and down the center of the, the, the front of the chest, and then also at about waist level, separates upper body from lower body. And whatever is in upper body tends to drain toward the axillary lymph nodes. Whatever is below the waist tends to drain towards inguinal lymph nodes. So what we do with the manual lymph drainage is we utilize those other lymph node groups through a special mechanism and enable um, optimal flow to healthy lymph node sites. Goals of CDT. Um, the most obvious one, I guess, is to decrease the swelling and maintain it. Um, but in addition to that, there's so much more that you need to keep in mind, particularly now where there's a focus on insurance companies mandating that you have functional goals. Since the decrease of swelling and maintaining a reduction isn't really a functional goal, it's an important goal. But um, this, by controlling the swelling, will help prevent infection. It will help remove excess protein, and as it does, then those tissues will soften, and they will not be as, as hard and as unyielding. Um, it, it helps to improve function of the individual. If the limb is softer and smaller and not as heavy, they're going to move better. They're going to wear clothing better. They're going to feel better about themselves. So all of this contributes to quality of life. So you are smart therapists, and I'm, I know you could make this list even much longer than it already is. Let me just briefly go over a few case studies because these are exciting. These are true before and after pictures of patients who had swelling and then received um, decongestive therapy in my, um, in my clinic for the most part. There's a few patients that weren't mine. Um, the lady on the left is the lady you saw at the very beginning of this presentation um, who'd had the mastectomy um, with full axillary node dissection. 
she underwent a few weeks of complete decongestive therapy treatment and got into compression garments, a compression sleeve and glove, and she was discharged looking like that on the, on the right side of your screen. Now, I apologize for the difference in skin tone. I know it would be easy to think she's not the same lady. Um, this was back in the Polaroid camera days, and the dye packs were a little different. So this is indeed the same patient, but um, the skin tone I recognize is very much different. Um, she, after all those decades of having lymphedema and a pretty non-functional left upper extremity, she had been able to regain function in her um, arm, even though it was her non-dominant arm, um, with great success. This individual you've seen as well, he had the car accident on his bike. Um, and after he went through complete decongestive therapy and the edema was reduced, we got him in a ready to wear um, compression stocking, knee high compression stocking. And um, uh, within three to four weeks of when he went through treatment, his wounds were healed. And that was after he had wounds present for one full year post-injury. And he was healed only because the edema was managed. And then once he went into a compression stocking after the edema was reduced, uh, he was able to manage uh, very well after that. This individual was not my patient, but um, was a patient of a colleague of mine born with primary lymphedema. Uh, the gentleman lived in New York City and um, had suffered with this massive, massive amount of leg and foot swelling for much of his life. And he went to his doctor saying, hey, I want an amputation of my leg. And the reason for that was that this was back before the United States had really any available resources for the management of lymphedema. So he said, since I can't get better, I just want the leg chopped off. And fortunately, there was um, an instructor and a physician who had established a clinic, two clinics in New York and New Jersey. And this physician had heard about those clinics. And he said to the guy, I have heard there's a place in the area where you can get conservative treatment. Go and try. If it doesn't work, you can always come back and we'll reconsider. And he went and he got some months of therapy. But what you see on the right-hand side of your screen is the reduction he had in his leg and his foot. The only surgery he had for any kind of reduction was a skin reduction surgery to reduce some of the excess volume of skin on the dorsum of his foot, which is where that little black uh, scab is. Otherwise, the skin pretty much returned to normal dimensions. Initially, it's very saggy and stretched out, Oftentimes, with time, it will tend to straighten, uh, um, tighten back up. And other times, uh, simply a removal of some excess skin is a rather simple operation. So it is amazing the reduction that you can find with complete decongestive therapy. This is another example, a lady not nearly as involved, but had a really nice reduction with conservative treatment. This lady as well, you can see from left slide to right slide, a modest reduction. And depending on the severity and the longevity of the lymphedema really dictates how long you treat them, um, as in how many visits. Uh, mild lymphedema may be able to be successfully treated in eight or nine treatments. Very severe lymphedema, the patient will be on caseload for quite some time. Uh, perhaps even in different episodes of care. This individual also had primary lymphedema. I know it looks like there's a severe infection in his hand. He did not have an infection in his hand. It was just the extreme inflammation and fibrosis from years and years of swelling. Um, unfortunately, at one point, he was issued a sl compression sleeve with no compression glove. Um, I don't know the details of that, uh, but that only exacerbated the swelling in the hand. But this individual also went through conservative treatment with a remarkable outcome. Now, 
again, because of the chronicity, these patients will always need to provide some care, some compression, some self skin management. Um, this lady uh, I've been blessed to know. She was at the training facility where I got trained in 1996. And she also had primary lymphedema. Uh, she was still functional. She could walk. But she came to the attention of the doctors when she was having trouble getting in and out of her car. And again, this was at the same time where lymphedema treatment in the U.S. was just coming on the horizon. So she received extensive care. Um, and it may have been in different episodes as well. And this middle picture is one year post-treatment. Now she still has quite a large lobule on the back of her calf. Um, that lobule was subsequently surgically removed. Um, I'm sorry for the color of the slides. Um, she has very dark skin and it's hard to show a contrast. Um, but to this day, um, she controls her swelling well with a combination of compression bandaging and compression garments. So when you have a patient who is at risk for lymphedema or maybe is just beginning to develop early signs of lymphedema, it's important to provide them with essential um, elements of treatment. Education is key to minimizing the risk. Let them know risks for infection, what they can do to help prevent risks for infection, how to provide some prophylactic manual lymph drainage to help stimulate the lymphatic system. Maintaining ideal weight is very important in the management of lymphedema because um, uh, lymphedema difficulties increase with increased weight. There's not really a lymphedema diet. There is not a lymphedema diet. However, um, maintaining low, um, low salt diet, low fat is controversial anymore. It's not as recommended as it used to be as long as the person is maintaining good weight. Uh, but a low, uh, an anti-inflammatory diet or a diet um, that will have less likelihood of causing inflammation in the body we're now recognizing as important to the management of lymphedema. Practice activity precautions is um, uh, educate them in what is safe to do from an exercise standpoint so as not to exacerbate the swelling, but also not to become a couch potato and not do any activity at all. Um, they want to, um, it's good to recommend avoiding restrictive clothing and jewelry just so that you're not further impairing lymphatic drainage. Um, although this is controversial and supposedly is undergoing evidence-based testing, um, the avoidance of blood pressures and injections on the affected limb is still recommended by most all lymphedema clinicians. Um, some of the evidence base will say, no, that's uh, basically um, malarkey. Uh, you don't need to worry about uh, blood pressures and injections and immunizations in the affected limb uh, any longer. Um, there's no validity to that, but um, anecdotally and from a clinician standpoint, if a patient has an at limb risk, um, they should not be, they should be recommending the medical community use other limbs for interventions. And wearing a compression garment when flying, again, that's undergoing scrutiny as well. Uh, some therapists will recommend it um, for shorter duration flights when somebody does not have swelling. It may not be essential if somebody has established lymphedema already, and particularly if they're taking a longer air flight, um, a compression garment is warranted because of the reduced cabin pressures tending to make the limb swell more. So this brings us to the conclusion of this lymphedema presentation. I hope that it is something that you have benefited from, learned from, um, from a physiological standpoint, and as well as from a clinical management standpoint. Um, for those of you who are interested in lymphedema certification, you can look for various lymphedema schools online. 
Um, I do teach for close training and consulting. I would love to have you in one of my classes. Um, if you do take a, a close training and consulting course, you may ask for a tuition discount. You can drop my name if you want to. Um, I'm very pleased. I obviously have a bias, but I think uh, close training is a supreme um, certification course in the management of lymphedema. And you would learn a vast amount from it if this is an area of interest to you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your patience. And I wish you well in your management of patients with swelling. Have a good summer.